I understand now why people use their um, smartphones instead of paper. You know, right about now, I'm wishing that I, I had some pithy saying written on one of those t-shirts in the style of the keep calm and carry on. For you see, this is the second congregation that I have served that has gotten ready to take a giant leap forward, only to be thwarted by the stock market. In 2008, the Bozeman congregation became aware and I think it was on a Tuesday or a Thursday night that there was a church that was for sale and we desperately wanted our own building. Well, by Monday morning, that dream was crushed by the Great Recession. And of course, now we at this church are kicking off our most aspirational and inspirational, which really means big dollars, annual budget drive ever as the stock market has tumbled in response to the coronavirus outbreaks, and they think the sell-off is probably gonna continue, but the stock market, remember, is an emotional response. So maybe we need to think about our emotions, and maybe we'll get a better response. <laughs> and also, I know that there are those of you who love crisis as opportunity, and yes, this is probably the right time to invest in the stock market. But others of you are probably worrying about your retirement or your savings going up in flames. And yet, here I am, willing and able, ready to ask each of us to keep calm and carry on and to choose to financially support this church. In spite of uncertainty in so many aspects of life, in spite of fear of a failing economy or a coronavirus epidemic. Though I have to say that the recommendations from our health department for prevention kind of seem like a duh for me. <laughs> wash your hands. Actually, you need to wash them to the length of singing happy birthday to yourself. So wouldn't our restrooms be a wonderful place if everybody was there? You said twice? Twice, not once. That's gone up since I last was engaged in this activity. You know, you're supposed to avoid touching your nose or your mouth with your hands or your eyes. That's gonna be a lot harder than we think. Here's a real big no-brainer. Stay home if you're sick. Cover your mouth and nose with a tissue or your sleeve when coughing or sneezing. And if you're really worried, you should probably stock up on your medications and food and water for your potential time of isolation. And as of this morning, the medical community is asking us not to buy up all the masks because there is a shortage now for medical providers. One thing I would like to, us to do here at UUCE is instead of holding one another's hands, during our closing hymn, that we either put our arms through each other's or gently reach as high as you can to make contact with the person's clothing who is standing next to you. Try not to hold hands. Use the restrooms. I want to hear a lot of happy birthday after the service. <laughs> also know that we are finally going to install hand sanitizers in places around the church even though Purell is becoming a, an item that is in becoming more and more scarce. But now, getting back to the money. <laughs> I want to repeat that I can think of no better time to support this church. In times of uncertainty, we can create one certainty, this community. It can be what no other institution or organization can be, a place of refuge, and sanctuary, a place of welcome and comfort, a place that we come into and go out of, into the world recharged to do and be, and to help in the process of tikkun, of repairing a broken world. Those of us who attend or are members here have widely varying financial circumstances. For some of us, giving to the church is a lifelong habit or any other religious organization. It's been ingrained since childhood. It's just what we do reflexively. For others of us, there is the desire, but our resources are short. And that causes us to feel apologetic. And for those of you who are come-inners to this religious 
organization or to any religious affiliation, this giving business can be a shock or confusing. So I don't want to hear any apologies from people who contribute that their contribution is too small. There's nothing, there's no such thing as too small and there's no such thing as too large. <laughs> All contributions matter. And as the offering words state, to give is an opportunity. It is to say that this is my community, that I have need of it, and that it has need of me. And right now, I have this bizarre impulse for all of us to sing a revised version of Pete Singer's This Land is My Land. So turning to one another and singing, this church is my church, this church is your church, from time immemorial to time eternal. And that's as far as I got. <laughs> How about, will you join me? This church is your, my church. This church is your church. From time immortal to time eternal. And you can finish it later. <laughs> Several years ago, I, I, prepped, I prefaced my annual stewardship sermon by saying that the congregation only had to listen to me talk about money once a year. When it came time later in the service for the offering, the worship associate said something along the lines of, you may only have to talk about money once a year, but we have to talk about it every Sunday. And that gave me pause. There was an article in the Utney from several years ago, and it stated, money is not profane. If a tree is sacred, and a baby is sacred, and baby poop is sacred, if everything is sacred, then money certainly must be as well. It is part of the stuff of life. Well, if it's been elevated to the level of the sacred, then don't you think it should be discussed by religious people and for sure by ministers openly and honestly from the pulpit? Notions that polite people do not discuss money or that it should be shrouded in secrecy does more harm than good. You know, last year, after I gave my stewardship sermon here, I returned to my office to find a phone message waiting for me. And it was from someone who attended the service that day. And they said that I had shamed them, that they had $35 in their bank account and that they were never coming back to this church. That gave me pause. But I immediately called that person and heard them out. Then I essentially told them that the church doesn't use shame or fear or guilt to ask folks for money. That each person or family unit has many ways of giving to the church, but that those who can are asked to give generously in their financial resources. And that even those who have nothing financial to give are no less welcome than those who can. That they, with their $35 in their bank account, were welcome here. So what is it about money that is so dang shaming for we humans? No matter where you are in the socioeconomic scale, you're shamed if you, you don't have it, and you're shamed if you do. I remember participating once in a UU-sponsored workshop on class. Remember that in this country, class is defined by wealth. The leaders had all of us do one of these exercises that we're all coming to hate, which is that we were to line up according to what class we came from. Whether we had the poor or the impoverished at one end and we had the wealthy at the other. And the middle class was in between. Now, I know that in these times there seems to be no middle class, but in that workshop it was the biggest category. I remember seeing a friend whose father was a doctor place herself squarely in the middle class. I was appalled. Then we were all asked to talk about how it felt to be where we were in the lineup. It was painful to hear from the professor who had grown up impoverished in the West Indies. Likewise, it was humanizing to hear from the three or four folks who were at the other end, in the upper class, rich or wealthy. 
But here's the thing. Everybody in that room wanted to identify as middle class. It was safe. You didn't stick out. It wasn't shaming. And here's the reality. Money is a fact of our modern day lives. Each of us has our own personal myths about money, and it's important to understand where they came from or how they developed. Because some of the beliefs that we hold about money, they probably aren't rational. And they're probably not based on a, any solid financial strategy. Though by defini definition, money is n a neutral material concept, our attitudes toward it, our relationship with it, are anything but neutral. So anytime we're having a discussion about money, the room is overcrowded with internal voices. Money is that which we don't seem to be able to live without, and is at the same time that thing that we wish we could live without. It's been used to control, to exclude, to oppress, to exploit, to dominate, to man manipulate, and to destroy. It has symbolized power, control, privilege, security, and freedom. It has been used also to satisfy basic human needs, as well as extravagant human desires. It has kept people in their place. It has been used philanthropically and generously for the greater good. And as to the role of money in our lives, it seems that either you have it or you don't. And if you have it, believe it or not, you worry about it. And if you don't have it, you worry about it. Either way, it's exhausting and demoralizing. It controls too much of our lives. If you want to ruin a friendship, well, just enter into some kind of business or financial transaction or venture with a friend. You want to have a fight with your partner or spouse? Bring up money. Want to have a fight in your family? bring up money. It's a struggle also for us to figure out in this world what is enough. What is enough? Enough money. And the other thing is we've let our relationship with money sometimes supersede even our most intimate relationships in an effort to get our most basic needs met. You know, we weren't always consumers. We were taught this after World War II. We were taught this, and if we were taught it, we can unlearn it. We can learn that you don't have to buy on credit and bear debt to be deemed patriotic. We can be thrifty and financially responsible. And here's this other thing about money. It is value-laden. Each day, we are given what seems like infinite opportunities to spend or not to spend our money. Every purchase in life is a life purpose decision. We spend our money on that which we consider basic or necessary. We spend our money on that which we desire. We spend our money on causes or people or organizations that reflect our values. Each day, we decide how much is enough, how much is sufficient. Each day, we get to decide where to put what we have earned with our life energy. Because trust me, it is our life energy. So when it comes to money, I think it would do us all well to spend some time with the following questions that I'm going to read to you. They're questions I came up with years ago after reading that now sort of classic book, Your Money or Your Life. Um, I used to preach a sermon called Your Money and Your Life. That's what the church wants, your money and your life. <clears throat> You know, and I would encourage you to, if you have families, to talk about these questions with families. I would encourage you to talk about it in small groups. I would encourage you to be public about talking about money. So here's the first one. What message or messages did you receive from your family about money when you were growing up? What did you learn about money? Was it sacred or profane in your household? Was money even discussed in your family? Or was it somehow magical? Did your family consider itself rich, blue collar, middle class, working class, 
poor? Did your family give regularly to any kind of institutions? When you were young, did you have to save up for things that you desired, or were they given to you? Were you given an allowance? What did your parents pay for, and what did you have to pay for? Who handled the money in your family? Was it used as a reward, or as a bribe, or as a punishment? Was money, or the lack thereof, ever a source of embarrassment to you? Was it shameful? Did you feel like you had to somehow apologize either for having it or not having it? Were you set apart from your peers because you had more or less money than they did? Did money have strings attached to it? Was money given instead of love or affection? Did the whole subject of money just ever plain confuse you? Were there arguments about money? Did you feel that there was always enough money, never enough money? Did you learn anything about how to manage money or how to budget? So those are some of the introductory questions that I would invite you to consider. And now back to the annual budget drive. <laughs> I know that it's not sexy or exciting to just be asked to give to the operating budget. It sounds kind of like surgery, right? You can, get to, you can get people to give to something that's tangible. But my friends, so much of what church is about isn't tangible. Church is about home. It's about place. It's about community. It's about belonging, personal and spiritual growth, service, justice, connection, transcendence, and embodiment none of which can be bought or sold. That said, the church and its operating budget is the container we all create for those things to be nurtured and nourished within. Remember the lines from the reading? I pledge because it tells the truth about who I am. If I did not pledge, I would look, lose track of these truths about who I am. By pledging, I remember who I am. Engagement in church allows us to remember who we are, what we believe in or don't believe in, what is of ultimate value or truth for us to be part of a faith that is based in community and chooses life and resistance even in the face of the mess that this world is in. Because we have community, we can, as one of our hymns suggests, say yes to life. So being a little slow on the uptake, I didn't quite understand the theme for this year's budget drive, Vision 2020. Obviously, it's a play on words, which I now understand. Vision for the year coming, 2020, vision beyond that, and also the idea that 2020 vision is perfect vision. I immediately started worrying about the potential ableism with the use of the word vision. I did. And then I started worrying that I didn't know the difference between the mission, the vision, objectives, strategies, goals, end statements. You'd think that being like in my 37th year of ministry, I would get this stuff. But you know, sometimes you need other people to do this kind of work. And in this case, it happened to be your board, who was way ahead of me because they'd already begun talking about the church's vision in preparation for the call for a settled minister. Now, one thing I really think I do understand is that mission defines an organization's reason for being. Its focus is here and now in the present. And yours boils down to three words. Do you know what they are? Love. What's next? transformation, and the last, to serve. Most excellent. It's a great mission statement. A vision statement, quote, draws a picture of a hoped for future. Who do you want to be? What do you want to be doing? Board President Daniel Blades talked about the vision statement functioning as a kind of North Star a corrective when we go off course. 
It keeps full, pulling us forward beyond complacency and sometimes comfort. It doesn't let us be lazy. The way we are using the word vision is metaphorical. It's not literal or physical. It's an internal sense of what is hoped for made external. Each board member agreed to take on the homework of coming up with their vision for UUCE. As the minister of the church, I am ex officio on the board and all other committees, task forces, etc. So think of it as a loud voice without vote. <laughs> but I wanted to do this homework assignment. And so I'm going to share it with you. And please remember, it's just my vision. It doesn't have to be yours. And I'm not even sure all these things are sort of vision statements. So bear with me here. Number one, we have helped facilitate the presence of tiny houses in Eugene. I should mention that these aren't in any particular order. They just came to me. The church is a place for reflection, ongoing faith formation and education and justice making. We are involved in the growing and distribution of food. Each person has a group of people within their church that they can call their peeps, their group, their safe space. Members of the community take responsibility for their spiritual journeys and for maturation of them. Friends and members care for and allow themselves to be cared for. Communication is streamlined and effective. The work of church, whatever it is, from board work to pulling weeds, is done collaboratively. Worship is creative, it's life-saving, inspiring, filled with music. People's stories are held as sacred. They are honored and respected. We as a church are not static or stuck. We have enlarged the span of our sources and resources to include the traditionally marginalized or underrepresented as we do our work. Hospitality and generosity are our practice and language. We are shaped and reshaped by those who come through our doors as well as those who are already present. We are a community that has the ability to try new things, to expare a succeed and expare a fail. We have an equal capacity or capability for negotiating conflict and covenant. We are truly multi-generational, multicultural, multi-ethnic, or multiracial. People feel safe here. They are able to risk being vulnerable and authentic. We have solar panels and rain catchment system in place. Hallelujah. We participate in barn raisings for members and friends of the community. Our mission of being empowered by love, being transformed and serving our world is known by all ages from cradle to sage. We know who we are as a congregation and where we are going. And like Australian shepherds, we say, what's next? What's next? <laughs> With great enthusiasm. And I know that if you're going to give to the non-tangible vision 2020, it has to be compelling. If you can't give to the vision, then give to the container that holds the vision, sexy or not. Find a way to embrace this church, this community, through your financial support, your volunteer time, your presence in worship, your participation in groups or committees or task forces. And I want to leave you with some words from Randy Pausch. Some of you may remember him. He was an engineering professor at um, Carnegie Mellon. At the age of 47, he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, which would kill him pretty quickly. And he was invited to give what was called the last lecture series. And you may be surprised by which piece of it I'm going to share with you. Because he said this, decide whether you are a tigger or an Eeyore. Now I know all about tiggers. Tiggers bounce. 
They are both lovable and pesty, annoying even, but bouncing one's way through life is not a bad way to travel. I also know about Eeyore, whose gloomy pes pessimism serves as a corrective to the incorrigible Tiggers of the world. So, Tigger, Eeyore. Tigger, Eeyore. I have to go with Tigger. I do. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. And besides, bouncing is contagious. It can bear the weight of a lot of gloom and doom. It can carry us into 2020 and beyond.